Well, my, my role is as Director of Forensic Science SA. Uh, we do all of the forensic science for the justice system in South Australia, and it's a really interesting role. Perhaps just a little of th about the role and then how I came to it. Uh, courts now are requiring more and more forensic science. It seems that every jury now expects that in most cases there's going to be a welter of information on gunshot residue and, uh, and glass fragments, and not to mention DNA. There must be DNA. It's a crime scene after all. Life's not that simple and there's not necessarily forensic evidence for every crime scene, but increasingly we depend on it. I guess if you go back many years, uh, people tended to be convicted on what was called eyewitness evidence. All of the evidence we have now suggests that eyewitnesses are not very reliable at all. Uh, they often get things wrong, whereas really good scientific evidence is much more dependable. So the justice system wants more and more of it, and we see around the world now, most advanced nations are investing a lot more money in forensic science. How did I come to this role? Well, when I went through university, forensic science wasn't a big issue. There were no forensic science courses, though I was interested in that. Uh, I did a, an original degree in pure and applied chemistry, and then I went on to do a PhD in nuclear chemistry because I thought nuclear chemistry sounded fantastically exciting. Uh, and Australia then was going to develop a, a huge nuclear industry. Australia decided not to develop a huge nuclear industry in the 1970s, and I thought, well, what else would I like to do? That led me into medical research and from medical research into uh, forensic science. It's a role I absolutely love and I can't think of anything I'd rather do. Perhaps we could talk just a little bit then about, so that's how I came to forensic science, about the sort of things we do. Everybody knows about DNA. So one of the things we spend quite a lot of time doing is uh, developing and maintaining the South Australian database of convicted offenders. So anyone in South Australia who is a suspect or convicted of a serious offence will have a buckle sample taken. That's a, a sample from the inside of their cheek. Uh, you see this in all the crime shows now where a, a small sample is taken and that is then stabilised onto special blotting paper. We then develop the person's DNA profile, which at the moment is like an 18-digit number, which is unique to them. Uh, that can then be put onto a computer database. Then whenever there's a crime committed, police crime scene investigators go to the scene of the crime and they see if they can find something that might have the DNA of the offender. This could be a blood sample, a semen sample, saliva, uh, skin cells from where they've touched something. They'll bring that back to Forensic Science SA and we have specialist people, scientists who are trained to examine the evidence, whether it's clothing, knives, guns, swabs taken from doorknobs, all manner of things. They see whether they can locate DNA on that particular evidence item, then if they can, they'll develop a DNA profile from it, and then they'll check the South Australian database to see whether or not they can find a profile that matches that on the South Australian database. If they can't, they then look on the Australian database. There are almost half a million people now on the Australian database. If they can find a profile that's the same as the profile on the evidence item, then they inform the police. Now, the fact that somebody's DNA is at a crime scene doesn't mean they committed the crime. It just means it's a good place for the police to start asking questions. And now, every year in Australia, there are thousands of crimes solved just by the application of this very simple technique now of having a database of convicted offenders and suspects and another database of DNA crime scene samples comparing one with the other. If at a crime scene sample we get a good DNA profile and it doesn't match anybody who's on the database now, then it just sits on the database. And every night we then have more people who have been suspects from around Australia Every suspect's profile gets compared with every unsolved crime in Australia. So it just keeps ticking over, solving more and more crimes. So it's an absolutely brilliant technology. And it ha it, that, together with uh, computerised fingerprinting, has revolutionised crime fighting in most Western countries. But forensic
forensic science isn't just about DNA. There's a multitude of other things we do. Uh, for instance, we work with the coroner. Now, the coroner is a judicial officer who looks into unexplained deaths and violent deaths. So anybody who dies in South Australia uh, as a result of uh, violence, whether committed by somebody else or if they appear to have committed suicide, uh, or if they're in institutional care, whether that means they're in jail or they're in a uh, residential home or in a hospital, all those deaths are reported to the coroner. In South Australia, we get about 2,000 deaths reported to the coroner every year. The first thing the coroner does is ask us at Forensic Science SA to give him an opinion on whether an autopsy is needed to establish the cause of death. Now, if it's a very simple case where the person has been perhaps in a, an old person's home or something like that, they've been chronically ill for a long time, getting sicker, and their death is not, unex not unexpected, then there's really no need to do uh, an autopsy. We'll advise the coroner of that. It is ultimately the coroner's decision as to whether an autopsy will be done, but he usually accepts our recommendation and an autopsy won't be done gets rid of about six or seven hundred of the coronial deaths in South Australia. That leaves us with around about 1,200, 1,300 deaths where an autopsy does have to be done. These are very important because sometimes we uncover that a person's death isn't accidental as expected. Sometimes we uncover that poisons have been involved. Sometimes we find drugs. Sometimes we find that the person has actually been murdered and their death has been uh, rigged up to make it look like a suicide. So it's a very important role that we do. So that work is undertaken mostly by forensic pathologists. And we have about five or six forensic pathologists here who do the autopsies and write the reports for the coroner. They're assisted by our forensic toxicologists. Now these people are scientists who are very skilled in chemical analysis and use some really advanced machines. Some of the machines we have now, particularly uh, the ones involving liquid chromatography and uh, triple quadrupole mass spectrometry, are so sensitive that, for instance, if somebody put just a, a pinch of a drug into an Olympic-sized swimming pool and stirred it up, we'd only need two drops of water out of that swimming pool to tell you which drug was put in and how much was put in. Now, we don't measure water in Olympic swimming pools, but it's just a, an illustration of just how sensitive these techniques are. Invaluable in trying to work out uh, whether drugs or poisons have played a role in someone's death. We also do all of the drug work for the Roads and Traffic Authority. If somebody is pulled over by the police, they're driving erratically, the police suspect they're under the influence of alcohol or drugs, they'll do a breath, a breath test. If there is no alcohol present and the, dry and the police are still concerned, then they might do a roadside drug test. If that suggests that there might be, uh, the person might be under the influence of illicit drugs, then a sample comes to us and we use these extremely sensitive and specific techniques to ascertain that. Some of the other work we do is in uh, looking for gunshot residue. Uh, let's say a person has been murdered, they've been shot, the police have a suspect and they say, oh, no, no, I've never fired a gun. We can check their clothing and their hands because when you fire a gun, you get gunshot residue deposited all over you. So uh, we can check to see whether that's present. Broken glass is fantastic. To the average member of the public, broken glass might just look all the same. But to a forensic scientist, every window is different. And we can match the broken glass found at the scene of a crime or on a suspect to broken glass uh, that's involved with the crime. We also look at uh, when, if somebody's arrested by the police and they've got uh, little packets of white powder or pills on them, we analyse that to determine are they illicit substances, if so, how much. Um, and then there's a multitude of other things that are called trace evidence, whether it's hairs and fibres left at the scene of the crime or hairs and fibres on a suspect that might be uh, belong to a victim um, and a multitude of other just little looking at traces of evidence. For instance, document examination is still very important in a number of very high profile South Australian cases in recent years. Our document examiners 
have played a crucial role in saying, yes, a note found uh, at the scene of a crime or associated with a crime is in handwriting which is consistent with the accused, can indicate that the accused was involved, can also be quite critical in indicating the intent of the accused. So uh, there's a lots and lots of different elements of trace evidence. So that, together with toxicology, um, forensic pathology, DNA, that's some of the core work we do, but there's also lots of other elements. So I guess, in a nutshell, that covers the type of work we do at Forensic Science SA. Yes, Lisa, I am, and that I think that's a really exciting development. While not all of the people who do these courses will get jobs in forensic science laboratories such as my own, the courses that I've been involved with, and we have a lot of involvement with uh, Flinders University and Adelaide University here in South Australia, they're very good science courses. So. Uh, if people have done those courses, there will be jobs for them in, in medical research, in pathology, in environmental analysis, all sorts of areas. We need, as a society, we need people who are skilled in analytical chemistry and in really critical thinking. These courses teach that. So whether the person work, ends up working in a forensic science laboratory or another laboratory, they are courses that are really well worth doing and I would commend them to any bright young people who are interested in this type of work. The short answer is yes. Uh, fingerprints are usually a very good source of DNA. Uh, if you're talking 12 years ago, you'd be probably talking in the late 1990s. Now, up until around about the year 2000, the technology we were using then needed a lot of DNA. You really needed at least a blood sample the size of a 20 cent piece, a big blood splash to get enough DNA to do an analysis and there was no hope of doing it on a fingerprint. Uh, from the end of the 1990s coming into the early 2000s, we changed over to a new way of doing DNA analysis, which is much more sensitive and we can now usually get a DNA uh, very well off a fingerprint. Now all of Australia is about to change now onto what we might call the fifth generation of DNA technology and that will be capable of getting uh, DNA off even a tiny bit of fingerprint. It really is amazing technology. If you look at the evolution of DNA profiling, we're now at the fourth generation of DNA profiling uh, and it's very good. Back in the 1990s, we're at sort of third generation and it was pretty primitive. So the short answer is yes, we can now. When you say false positive, uh, I'd like to understand better what the case was. If you look at what are the ways in which DNA might give you the wrong answer? Well, firstly, if somebody has planted DNA evidence, as I said, just because your DNA is at the scene of a crime doesn't mean you committed the crime. If the DNA work in the laboratory is done well, 
then if you get a match of the DNA at the crime scene to the DNA of the suspect, then it really is beyond reasonable doubt that the two DNAs came from the same person, unless of course they have an identical twin who will have the same DNA. There are a number of cases uh, in Australia, uh, New Zealand and the rest of the world where there has been contamination of crime scene evidence. And the typical case is, and, and this is a potential problem with the uh, technology now being so sensitive that if you have uh, one particular crime scene sample or a, a sample reference sample from a person is allowed to contaminate a bench top and then the crime scene evidence from another crime is put onto that bench top when there's still traces of the DNA, then it's conceivable that the DNA can be transferred from one crime scene evidence item to another or from a reference sample to a crime scene. And there certainly seems to be at least some cases in the world, extremely rare, but fairly well documented where that has occurred. Now in laboratories such as my own, we spend an enormous amount of time decontaminating laboratories between cases and in training staff in the use of gloves, protective equipment, and, and the potential problems of DNA cross-contamination. So I guess it's something that we have to be ever vigilant about, uh, and certainly we are. We spend a lot of time to try and reduce the possibility of that occurring. Um, hi, Ross. We've got a question about that decontamination process. Is it a physical process of washing and wiping or a chemical process? Uh, it's both. Uh, we, wash, we, we use, on all of our examination benches, we use large, like butcher's paper that covers the, uh, the bench and then that's discarded and uh, with every new case, a new sheet is put down. And then we have chemical wipes and chemical dips that we use for decontaminating all of the equipment we use. And that's done between each case and the staff uh, handling the cases change gloves. So they use gloves to handle the evidence, they change gloves between cases. So just a whole routine of systems for trying to reduce the possibility of contamination between cases. Yes, I'm delighted to say there is. Uh, we have at the uh, CSIRO soils unit here in Adelaide uh, is actually a specialist group that uh, look at the for, at forensic science uses of particularly soil science, but increasingly looking at issues of uh, geology. In fact, they've uh, solved some really interesting cases. There was a fascinating one a couple of years ago where uh, there had been a murder uh, at one point in South Australia. The police had a suspect and they found a shovel in the boot of the car that they thought might have been used to bury uh, the missing person. And the police searched absolutely everywhere in the vicinity of the accused person's house and then didn't find anything and this was taken to the CSIRO soils unit who looked at the shovel and said, oh no, that soil doesn't come from anywhere around here. It, the only place that could come from is in the Adelaide Hills, which is about 100 kilometres away. Not only that, the type of soil and the, is not from surface soil. This is from deep down. It looks like it's probably come from a quarry or something like that. And by looking at the type of grains, they were actually able to locate an area in the Adelaide Hills, which is more than 100 kilometres away from the suspected murder site, where they thought it may have come from. Uh, the police then located a couple of quarries in that area, got the sniffer dogs out, and found some disturbed ground at one of those quarries and uncovered the bodies. So, yes, forensic geology and soil science is very much... Uh, coming to the fore and this unit in Adelaide is now a specialist unit that offers its services to uh, all, all jurisdictions throughout Australia. We've had a question from someone asking about the mass spec machines that they have in airport that 
do the swan and um, how tired they work and how sensitive they are. And um, she's concerned because she works in a lab and so she's worried that one day she'll get pulled over because she might have some sort of chemicals from working in a lab. Um, uh, they are very sensitive. They're, I'm not particularly familiar with them. I think they are a top, what's called a time of flight uh, mass spectrometer that's usually used for that type of work. And yes, it, um, it is an issue and uh, a colleague of mine who works in a related field recently was pulled up at the airport because he, he had uh, contamination on the clothing he'd been using in the laboratory. So it is a, it is a concern. Uh, I was, before I was in South Australia, I was director of the laboratory in Sydney and um, Sydney introduced sniffer dogs on the trains that they were using to check people, uh, commuters on the trains to see if they had drugs and all of the staff who worked in the, um, in the illicit drugs laboratory, of course, who handle samples of cannabis and amphetamines and opiates, that's what they do for a job every day were concerned and so I'd, I had actually issued all of them with an ID card which I signed saying that um, they worked with drugs and this gave them, certainly gave them no authority to be carrying drugs but certainly sniffer dogs trained to detect drugs might show an unreasonable interest in them by virtue of their uh, profession. So yes, it's a, it certainly is a, a realistic concern. Give you a really good one, Lisa. This one, th this one occurred just late last year. Uh, police were called to a scene, and when they got there, they found a young man in his early twenties um, lying there, dead, with the needle literally still, still beside him, and the tourniquet still around his arm. This looked almost certain. This had to be a heroin overdose. That's usually what happens. Somebody is used to having impure heroin, gets a, gets a very uh, pure batch, gives themselves a dose that they think will give them a high and in fact it's enough to kill them and literally they're dead there with the syringe in their arm. It is not uncommon in people who are heroin addicts. So it seemed like a very straightforward case. The body was brought into Forensic Science SA. The, um, the forensic pathologist did the autopsy they could find no, uh, no injuries to the man, so almost certainly his death was caused by whatever he had injected himself with. They took samples of blood, sent them up to the forensic toxicology lab and expected to get a high dose of heroin. No heroin was detected. Thought, hmm, what's going on here? Checked for all of the other common drugs, couldn't find anything. Uh, and then, but there was on the mass spec trace just one little blip that didn't make any sense. It was not something we had detected ever before. Uh, we then sent the police back to interview his friends and uh, nobody could uncover any information uh, there until somebody said, oh, well, he was experimenting with some, uh, with some material he'd got from a Chinese health food store. Um, I forget the name of it now. It's a drug that's supposed to have aphrodisiac qualities and people usually uh, and, uh, take it and it's supposed to have um, some extracts from toad skin. Toads often, like the Australian cane toad, are very toxic and uh, some people think that if you have a little bit of them it can make you a bit high. Uh, so we then checked very thoroughly and found, in fact, we found traces of the poison bufotenine Bufo, meaning Latin for toad, so the poisonous substance in toad skin is uh, one, of the, one of the many chemicals there is bufotenine. And this young man had died of bufotenine poisoning by injecting himself with extracts from the skin of a toad. So don't do it. 